mighty word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to guide my way. What do we look at to examine the immediate context? This is one of the most important aspects of Bible interpretation, and yet it seems to be the most neglected. We've already discussed understanding sentences, and in that regard, we mentioned evaluating the immediate context. The meaning of sentences is the beginning of this process. To keep us on the right track, there are rules that help us stay consistent in application. I know, more rules. But without them, we'll end up making the Bible mean whatever we like. Don't we already see that all around us in religion? So rule number one is induce only the facts in a case. It isn't difficult to see details in a case when they aren't really there. They may make sense and may even be accepted by a majority of Bible students. Assuming details in a Bible text, no matter how likely the scenario, is not a use of the inductive method. One might do so for the purpose of imagining how certain events might have played out, for example, I do this while trying to catch a better glimpse of, of the trial of Jesus or the garden scene or the crucifixion. But I have to always remember that these details are assumed. It's not wrong to have an opinion, but opinion, in fact, must be kept separate. As an example where this pops up, two incidents in Israel's history often get mixed together or conflated. The first is God's command for Moses to strike the rock to get water for the Israelites. That's in Exodus 17 and verse 6. The second is a later incident in Numbers 20 where God commands Moses to speak to the rock for water. The common interpretation of the sin of Moses in the second incident is that he struck the rock when God didn't say to. When I examine the second text, I find Three interesting details. First, God did command Moses to take the rod with him. Second, the text emphasizes the fact that Moses did take the rod just as God had commanded him. And the third detail is in the silence of God's rebuke concerning the rod and the sin of Moses. God rebukes Moses for what he said to Israel, taking the glory for himself and for Aaron, but says nothing about any sin in striking the rock. When I induce all of the facts in the case, all I can know for certain is that the sin committed by Moses was in what he said to Israel. To say that God didn't tell Moses to strike the rock is assuming we know all that God said. Of this, we must always be very careful. Possibly Moses was not to strike the rock, but the text does not tell us that this was the case. When our assumptions take us beyond the stated facts, we have ceased from inducing and resorted to our inserted opinions. Is it an inescapable conclusion? I can make an equally valid case for Moses expecting the reader to remember the previous incident found in Exodus 17. When Numbers 20 tells us of God's command to take the rod, we may be expected to remember and expect the same action, striking the rock. So which is it? Well, I have to assume facts to draw either conclusion. There is nothing wrong with an opinion on this, but all we know for sure is what Moses says, and we should be careful how we teach it as fact to others. Now, rule number two in what kind of composition is the text found? If it's in an uh, apocalyptic composition, then one should watch for symbolism, which we will discuss later in this series. In fact, it won't be very long. If it's poetry, then one should watch for parallelism, which we already discussed in videos 31 and 32. If it's an epistle, then we should determine the overall tenor of the work. Knowing something about the book in which the text is found can be invaluable in understanding the author's intentions and becomes a part of the immediate context. Well, that's it for part one. In our next video, we'll discuss two more important rules to follow while examining the immediate context. 
I hope you'll join me for that study.